Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us once again for the uh, high energy pizza lunch, uh, Sans Pizza. I'm afraid I don't even have a background yet. Um, but uh, uh, today's uh, first speaker will be uh, it'll be Martin Pohl. Yeah. And Martin um, got his PhD at University of Bonn, his habilitation at Ruhr University of Bochum. Uh, he was a, an assistant and associate professor at Iowa State before moving to the University of Potsdam, where he's been a full professor. And now he is a leading scientist at DESI. And today's talk will be about magnetic field structure and electron heating at collisionless shocks. So thank you, Martin. All right, good. Uh, so I hope you can see um, my slides or the title slide at least. All right, I see nodding. Good, let's, let's right get to it. Okay, and then it doesn't move forward. All right, here we are. Um, so when I say shocks, um, I, I want to talk about a specific type of, of shock. A, uh, it's supposed to be non-relativistic, so we're not talking about AGN, gamma ray bursts, uh, possible nebula or the like. We rather talk about supernova remnants. We could also talk about stellar wind shocks. Um, we can talk about uh, shocks in the heliosphere, like uh, Saturn's bow shock here, which will actually feature quite prominently later in, in this talk. So by and large, the shock I'm interested in are non-relativistic and have sonic Mach numbers in excess of 10, maybe not very much in excess of 100, but at least uh, larger than 10. And likewise, alphenic Mach numbers, so shock speed in units of the alphene speed, larger than 10. Uh, as the, the title implies, what I'm going to be interested in is the temperature that the electrons have immediately behind the shock and the strength of the magnetic field at the shock. You presumably all know the uh, jump conditions that tell you that the perpendicular component of the magnetic field gets amplified at a shock by essentially the same factor the density gets boosted. But there's actually more to that, at least at the shock itself. Why is this interesting? Well, there are actually three reasons. Uh, one is um, I'm sort of by trade interested in very high energy particles, in particular electrons, because they radiate very efficiently. Now, uh, we know an acceleration process that operates at shocks, but that process, diffusive shock acceleration, requires that the particles have a Lama radius small enough that, they, that they're not significantly deflected uh, while they're passing through the, uh, the shock. So the Lama radius has to be, sorry, large enough. And that means the mom momentum of the particles has to exceed a certain value. Now for the ions that basically only requires giving them a moderate kick, but for the electrons, uh, that's really difficult because they need to boost their uh, momentum up to that of the ions, uh, is essentially. And that's a large way uh, from uh, the momenta that the electrons have right at or immediately behind the shock. Now, how far they have to go, of course, depends on what the temperature is of the electrons. And so any other acceleration process that you need to boost the electrons up in energy so that they can undergo diffusive shock acceleration also depends on what temperature you start with. And the magnetic field, of course, determines uh, the Lama scale in itself, right? So that factors in. Now, also for X-ray spectra, immediately behind shocks, it's so that the the electrons typically are colder than the ions, but it's the electrons that uh, excite atoms through collisions. So the X-ray spectra depend on 
the temperature of those electrons. And then when you look at X-ray spectra, of course, you look at large regions, even with a fine resolution of Chandra, but um, you need to know what's going on, how much the electrons have already um, heated through other processes downstream of the shock depends on where they actually start in temperature. So that's why we want to know this. And we will in particular look at so-called perpendicular shocks, meaning there is a large scale magnetic field that lies in the plane of the shock. Whenever you have that, what essentially happens in phase space is what you see here in the bottom plot. So here is the spatial coordinate. We look uh, across the shock. Here is one of the velocity components. So you see ions come in, they get reflected at a perpendicular shock. They actually make one Lama orbit and then are dragged with the flow to the downstream. That gyration determines the thickness of the shock. So collisionless shocks always have a thickness that is determined by the Lama radius of ions with speed corresponding to the shock speed. Now, if you had an oblique shock or, or a parallel shock, the ions might go pretty far upstream. In that case, the shock is wider, but here we only talk about perpendicular shocks and that's not the case. So once you have that structure in phase space, in density, you see the following. So here is upstream, stuff comes in. At some point, you start to see the gyrating ions. That's what we call the foot. And that's a place where counter streaming happens between the reflected ions and the incoming particles. Plasma instabilities are driven there. Then the density goes up but it actually goes up to more than your jump conditions would suggest. This has to do with the fact that at this point, you have both the incoming ones, the transmitted ones, and those that are just about to be reflected into their Lama gyration here. So you have more than you actually have on average. That's what we call the overshoot. And there's a steep slope here. That's what we call the ramp. Important also is that there is a huge potential difference between here and there, which implies that there is an electric field, a large scale electric field across the shock. So this is how that looks in one of the simulations that we conduct. We do so-called particle in cell simulations, which means that you follow individual particles, many of them, billions of them, so the plasma is actually described by a, a large bunch of individual particles that you follow. Their current density is input to the Maxwell equations, which you also solve in parallel, and then the fields and, and the, give you the forces, and the forces determine how the charged particles evolve. So PIC simulations in principle is a combined solving of Maxwell's equation and the equation of motion of many, many, many charged particles. So here we need to do this in a very large system and we need to do this for a very long time. And that means we unfortunately can't do this in 3D. So we have only two spatial dimensions, meaning gradients in the third dimension are ignored, but we retain all three velocity components and all three components of the electromagnetic field. So here the foot starts. The top panel here is density. The uh, color scaling is not too fine grained, but uh, you see some changes in color. The density already increases here. You have the counter screaming and you have instabilities that are driven here typically electrostatic instabilities called Brunemann waves. We'll look at those in a bit more detail later on. Now, this is color-coded electrostatic field here. And then here in this ramp where the density increases quickly, another instability operates. That's the so-called Weibel instability. It gives us these filaments here, these yellowish long fingers. 
In their nonlinear evolution, they tend to break up. We see this here better. They tend to break up into little islands that form magnetic islands, in fact. The process that's very important there is magnetic reconnection. So all these things contribute to the heating of the electrons. So that's what we're going to talk about now. So to again recap, any shock, right? So um, stuff comes in with some speed, gets decelerated and compressed downstream. The magnetic field orientation, so the large scale magnetic field orientation changes because the perpendicular component is compressed, increased, the parallel one is unaffected. And then, at least for standard adiabatic indices like five thirds, we know that the density increases by a factor four. We know what the temperature ratio between downstream and upstream is. We, we also know that essentially the post shock thermal energy of particles is a certain fraction of the initial energy the particles have, the bulk kinetic energy that they have upstream. And essentially, one would expect if there is some magnetic structure that deflects the particles that we only isotropize them, really, in the rest frame of that magnetic field. And if that happens, then the particles retain their energy, at least in that particular frame, in which case the electron temperature will be lower than the ion temperature by the mass ratio, and that's a factor 2000. That's really tiny. That's not really what we see. We see temperature ratios with, with huge fluctuations, of course, that are more around 10%. You'd see this, um, again, these are, these are data of Saturn's bow shock um, here as a function of the alphanic Mach number, and they even distinguish by color whether the spacecraft crossed the shock towards Saturn or away from Saturn. So point I want to make is numbers here are 0 0.05, 0 0.1 or so. This is not one over 2000. Likewise, if you, if you do this, um, it's a paper by uh, Van Arnsberg. If you do this for supernova remnants, uh, I, I won't go into the, the, the technique of doing this. Uh, you can actually ask John Raymond all about it. Um, there's actually a, a, a tendency that the temperatures, temperature ratio, that's this beta here, is also around 10%, but has a significant trend when you plot this as a function of the shock speed. Okay, so, so the question I, I would ask is, can we, understand that with our simulations. So let's go through this. And if you try to do this, you find that there are at least five processes that you have to consider that contribute to heating. There's the so-called shock surfing acceleration that's way forward at the shock where we have those electrostatic waves. There is the shock potential of the large scale electric field I talked about. There's the magnetic reconnection there is stochastic Fermi acceleration because we have these magnetic structures that move around and the particles may just bounce off these things. And then the compression by itself adiabatically heats the electrons. So all these things we have. Now, the advantage of PIC simulations is that you can actually follow individual particles. And you see here, this is one particle that we follow. Um, and here you see uh, its energy, kinetic energy in time. And this marker here gives, gives the uh, time where we're at in the, in the top panel. So you see that these, these waves move from the upper left to the lower right. And once a particle is trapped, it's like trapped, being trapped within a potential well and being carried along. This does work. As that happens, um, there's no longer simply uh, gyration, but these things do work and the energy increases. Now, the trouble is that the incoming 
electrons are also the energy source for the waves. So you can't get out more than that. So per particle, uh, you might technically re reflect the particles that gives you twice their initial energy. So when I wanna devise a, a model for the energy increment through that process, which we call shock surfing acceleration, and scale this to the kinetic energy of the ions, I actually have to factor the mass ratio in here. And this factor alpha here is one that we try to derive from our simulations. So we run many simulations, different alphanic Mach numbers, different plasma betas and so forth. And we see that for alpha, we get numbers between a fifth or so and ballpark one. That depends a little bit on how we arrange on our 2D uh, simulation. But by and large, if this is one-ish, right, this is one over 2,000, we get a tiny fraction of the ion kinetic energy. So what of the second process? That's the shock potential. Now, uh, the issue here is you get the shock potential. You do have initially a magnetic field that's oriented this way, right? You have an electric field that's oriented that way, and then... Um, relatively elementary plasma physics tells you that the entire population should basically drift out of the plane, as opposed to gaining energy in this electric field. So we need some bending of the magnetic field, and that's exactly what we get from that viable instability. So that gives us a magnetic field structure that is strongly bent, so you have places where, where you can follow the electric field along the magnetic field line. Electric and magnetic field are at least roughly parallel. This is where you gain energy, right? And you can do this in a sort of regular fashion like it's sketched here. You get sort of 1% of the ion kinetic energy. You get roughly the same when you do this in turbulence on smaller scales as it evolves. So here you get maybe 1% or 2. Magnetic reconnection. So these viable filaments break up into these islands. There, magnetic field disappears, but the energy has to go somewhere, right? So it's basically B squared over ray pi needs to find a new host. And that can go to the electrons. Now we find that this process and its efficiency very much depends on how strong the magnetic field becomes in the viable filaments and how long they are and how much time they have to develop into the nonlinear phase at which they can actually undergo or dissipate by magnetic reconnection. And that makes the entire thing very much dependent on the alphanic Mach number. So if the alphanic Mach number is smaller than roughly 20, nothing really happens. Then the efficiency increases, but sort of beyond 100, it's basically constant. And you get, again, sort of a percent of the ion kinetic energy. What of the O? Oh, what of the uh, stochastic Fermi uh, acceleration? Again, you get relatively little because these things don't move very quickly. And the increment doesn't really depend on um, particular parameters. It essentially depends on how many collisions you have and how fast these things are. So little energy gain. And the adiabatic compression actually is not even something that gives you energy because you compress by a certain fraction and therefore heat by a certain fraction. And then you have all the other heating processes. And then you're, you're at the overshoot beyond which you decompress. So that means that doing decompression when you lose energy again or lose temperature again, you also lose a fair fraction of the increments you get from many of the other processes. So the 
overall effect of the adiabatic compression is actually slightly negative. That's this black line here. So from that, we construct a heating model, which um, here, if you look at it, that's what we measure in the simulation. That's what the, what the model predicts. I don't know if you, I actually have all these little video windows in front. Um, by and large, the, the numbers are similar and by and large, they're somewhere between 10 and 20%. So if you compare to the, to the data I, I showed before, we get something completely different from uh, the Van Adelsberg result for SNR shocks. We would actually get something that's independent of the shock speed. So for Saturn's bow shock, the data don't have enough the range really to, to see whether you know, this kind of slow increase with the Arfenic Mach number actually happens. Now, let me sort of maybe during the last one or two minutes also say a few words about the magnetic field amplification. Um, there was a model for that that is based only on compression. That's this line here. It goes back to a person named Leroy. Here are data taken with Cassini at uh, Saturn's bow shock. And since this model is only based on compression and doesn't really account for these viable filaments, we thought, well, we should look at it, particularly because here, at least at larger Mach numbers, the model doesn't quite fit. So we see here, this panel in particular tells us for the three field components, how much extra amplification you get. If everything is only compression, only the sine curve should be at one or the other ones at zero. That's not the case. Now we can generalize this and construct a model which data points are simulations and the um, green curves are sort of the model scaling. We see that the peak magnetic field increases with the alphenic Mach number or square root thereof. The fraction of the energy that goes into magnetic field falls off with one over the alphenic Mach number. And that's based on our understanding of how quickly the viable instability grows, how much time we have, how thick the shock is, and so forth. Now, um, that means we can construct our model and uh, lo and behold, actually it behaves quite nicely in comparison with these Cassini measurements here. Now, the fact that we now have this understanding for the increase of the magnetic field beyond compression at the collisionless shock, and we also have an understanding for um, for how long these magnetic field structures, this extra magnetic field survives. This tells us at what energy or what momentum the electrons can actually be injected uh, into diffusive shock acceleration and sort of what kind of range we would need to cover with um, any sort of preliminary or initial acceleration process. And that range increases with the alphenic Mach number. So um, let me summarize. So we used our simulations to construct a model that provides the scaling laws for electron heating at quasi-perpendicular shocks. It doesn't really reproduce um, or doesn't reproduce at all the, the observed temperature scaling that is seen in supernova remnants. And there might be reasons why that's so. Um, they're certainly not all quasi-perpendicular shocks. There might be also quasi-parallel shocks. There might be things that happen upstream of the shock that are not uh, included in our simulations that have to do with energetic particles. Uh, and I've also reported that the viable instability plays a strong role in amplifying magnetic field at the shock. There's a very nice match between our simulation results and what we see at Saturn's bow shock. 
Uh, and so we have models for the electron ion temperature ratio and the magnetic field that we can now use as starting points for uh, electron acceleration, first up to the injection energy, uh, to diffusive shock acceleration, and then also beyond, and for the analysis of X-ray spectra. And I probably went a little bit over time, but now would happily answer questions. Thank you, Martin, for a great talk. Uh, I think we have time for at least one question. Um, if you want to either uh, put your question in the chat window or raise your hand using the participants window, um, we'll uh, handle it from there. I'm not really sure I see the chat window at the same time. That's okay, I can call on people. So, 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 so just, just speaking up is probably good. Yes, P Pat, could you speak up? Yeah, I can. Uh, that was that was nice, Martin. But there was something that uh, escaped me. You went through very nicely these five different uh, um, <clears throat> ways of of heating. It seemed like each one was the first four were percent type. Uh, the fifth one, the compression, actually made it go the other way. So I was expecting you to say, "So we can't get anywhere close to ten percent." What did I? Where did I miss it? How did it get up to ten percent? Oh, the uh, what what I mean is by by the the uh, compression if, uh, effect is 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 negative is you don't get the adiabatic heating that corresponds to compression by a factor four but less. But it's not that it's sort of in total that you compress and in total get something. Um, so, uh, but um, so I had one percent of MIV squared, which is two percent actually. Uh, uh, of the iron, iron kinetic energy. Um, okay, and the fifth one doesn't necessarily lose. So, okay, I see where you get 10%. Okay. okay. Good. Okay, and uh, I think we can take Federico's question and then we have to move on. Yeah, Martin, thanks for a wonderful talk. Just a question. So in one of the first slides, you showed that uh, you might have a disruption of the viable filaments uh, uh, just in front of the shock or in the shock layer. So. Mm -hmm. Did you see in your simulations happening, for example, that uh, these, these uh, islands generated by this process don't merge uh, right where you see disruption, but uh, somewhere uh, past the advection downstream at the shock? So assuming that uh, you have the simulation box large enough to, to see. Let's, let's see. In, uh, I think I had somewhere this, I have this global. Right here. Um, now that that's that's density, of, of course, electron density. But maybe that that's good enough, right? So you see that here in the overshoot, you have quite a few places where uh, the density is enhanced. Here, here, here. And that actually, I mean, if you, our eye is pretty good at finding structure where there isn't any. Um, but uh, this looks a little bit like it's even slightly connected, right? So. That, that's, that some of these enhancements survive for some time. Now, once you come uh, arrive here, they're basically gone. Ah, okay. So that's, uh, that's uh, okay. So still, that, that's, that's electron density. It's still just very close to the shock, okay. So it's very unlikely you can have some uh, additional acceleration due to a possible reconnection a little bit further downstream. Um, at least, at least not from this, right? I mean, you. So, you know, these structures are are, are driven here. So, so as as you as you move to the uh, to the left, they relax, right? So that means you have less and less conditions that are ripe for for reconnection. Mm -hmm. So, what we're actually trying to do next is sort of artificially impose some turbulence upstream and see sort of what that does. So maybe that introduces some longer lived um, fluctuations downstream. You know, that's that's one of the goals. Thank you. Okay, then I guess I have to stop sharing. All right. Uh, thanks again to Martin Paul, and uh, it's time to move on to our next speaker. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let me. Yeah.
Sorry? Your screen. Yeah, I said, please share your screen. We yeah. can hear you. Our next speaker is Thomas Passini. He graduated from undergrad in Bologna in December of 2018 and is now a second year PhD student at Hamburg Observatory at Hamburg University. He mainly works on AGN feedback and galaxy clusters and groups. And today is gonna to tell us about this effect in one particular cluster. So please take it away. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so I'm going to show you the results of uh, an upcoming paper that will be published uh, hopefully this month. So a first view at the core of uh, ABEL 1668, offset cooling and aging feedback. Um, so first a short uh, outline of this talk. Uh, I will start with a brief introduction on cool -cool clusters, uh, on the cooling flow problem and on aging feedback. And then we will be able to focus more specifically on uh, uh, this cluster, ABEL 68. In doing this, we will make use of radio data from VLA of the first X-ray observation by Sandra of this cluster. And we will also combine this data with h alpha line emission to get a multi wavelength perspective on the core of this cluster. We will discuss the presence of uh, putative cavities in ABEL 1668 and try to make uh, some hypotheses on what could produce the environment that we are going to observe. And finally, I will give you some conclusions. So let's start uh, with uh, what is a cool -cool cluster. We know that galaxy clusters can be classified into merging clusters. So clusters that are currently undergoing or recently undergoing, for example, a major merger and uh, um, cool cores. Cool cores are in general more relaxed. And one of the main uh, features is to show a peak of uh, surface brightness emission close uh, to, the, to the central region, to the core of the cluster itself. Uh, you can see from this plot that uh, a single beta model uh, that is uh, usually what you want to use to fit uh, the, the surface brightness profile of a cluster is not able to reproduce uh, this peak. Uh, we need a double beta model, one for the outskirts and one taking into account uh, uh, the core of the cluster. Connected to this uh, surface brightness peak uh, is the cooling flow. Uh, the processes that uh, have led to the formation of the cluster, for example, mergers and interactions, have heated the intercluster medium, the ECM, to very high temperatures, around 10 to the 7 Kelvin. This means that the ECM is cooling, mainly through Bremsstrahlung and line emission, with a cooling time that is inversely proportional to the density of the medium itself. However, we know that uh, the central regions of the cluster are denser with respect to the outskirts. So to maintain the thermodynamic equilibrium, we expect a flow of cool gas that should move uh, from the external regions to the core, depositing a gas, a gas mass that should be proportional to the x luminosity emitted by the cooling region of the cluster, so the region that is efficiently cooling. This is what is known as the standard uh, cooling flow model. However, the, uh, the expected signature of this uh, cooling flow, for example, an onset star formation rate uh, in the BCG and line emission, are typically detected only between 1 and 10% of the rates that are predicted by this standard model. This is a very famous plot by Peterson and Fabian of 2006, in which we can clearly see the difference between the rates that are observed for the, for the cooling flow in blue and the predictions of the model in green. Uh, the red line is just another model. This is what is known as the cooling flow problem, and the solution for this was possibly found in Asian feedback. So the presence of an heating source, usually hosted in the BCZ, in the central galaxy of the cluster, that is able through mechanical feedback to quench the cooling of the ECM. This is a very peculiar image of Hydra A in which we can see the radio emission uh, colorized in, in red and the X-ray emission in blue. And we can see already from the image that uh, there is a very significant spatial connection between these two components, radio and X-ray. And the physical translation for this connection is the presence of cavities of the intercluster medium. In fact, we know that mechanical feedback uh, from the AGN is able to basically excavate bubbles in the ECM. These bubbles are usually, usually referred to as cavities and are filled with uh, radiating plasma, basically. And this is the same th thing that we are observing here. You can see that uh, at the location of the radio lobes, there is a sort of lack of uh, X-ray emission, and these are the cavities. Actually, the, the measured power of these cavities that is here plotted uh, for a bunch of systems uh, in the y-axis uh, is uh, comparable to the luminosity emitted by the cooling region of the cluster here on the, on the x-axis. So basically, these two components are somehow able to counterbalance uh, each other, creating what is uh, currently known as the AGM feeding feedback cycle. Now, let's focus on uh, ABEL 1668. This is a core cluster at a redshift of 0.06. 
Uh, as I said, we're going to use uh, two data sets by AVLA, one at five gigahertz of uh, uh, four hour exposure and uh, one at 1.4 gigahertz of uh, three hour exposure. We're also going to use the first uh, sound observation of this cluster, that is a 10 kilosecond snapshot. And we are also going to combine this data with the age alpha line emission from uh, BMOS. In the table, you can see the properties of, uh, of the radio observation. And um, as you will see, the main part of the talk will be related to the multi wavelength analysis. Uh, but first, just to, just to put some context, uh, let me first just go through the, the single X-ray energy analysis. Uh, so starting from the five gigahertz map, um, we can see that at the center of this cluster, there is this kind of uh, small radio source. Uh, here, the measure axis is 11 kiloparsec with a flux density that is around 20 millijansky and an RMS of six microjansky per beam. Uh, at this frequency, as well at, uh, uh, as a, at lower frequency, there is no hint uh, of the presence of uh, diffuse radio emission, like for example, mini halos that are sometimes uh, observed in, uh, in cool course. However, we are using uh, a, a array B uh, for the five gigahertz observation and array A, uh, array A uh, for the one to four gigahertz ob observation. And, and as you may know, these are not really the best to detect uh, diffuse emission. Uh, the situation is not uh, much different at 1.4 gigahertz. Uh, here, the measure axis is, of course, uh, slightly larger, uh, 14 kiloparsec, uh, and the flux density is 70 millijansky. So uh, with the redshift of this source, we can estimate the luminosity being around uh, 6.3 times 10 to the 23 watt per hertz. And given the shape uh, of this source and its uh, relatively low luminosity, we can classify it uh, as an FR1, and that is uh, what it's usually observed at the center of full cores. Um, now to the X-ray analysis, the first uh, thing that was done was to extract uh, a surface brightness profile and to fit it uh, uh, first with a single beta model that you can see here drawn in blue uh, with the parameter with, with the fit parameters on the right. And as expected from a, from a cool core, uh, the single beta model is not able to reproduce the peak in the center. So we use instead a double beta model, uh, one for the outskirts and one of the core uh, for the core. And you can see the improvement in the fit, uh, even in the uh, reduced key squared. Actually, the main aim, uh, the main purpose of the X analysis for us was to um, get an estimate of the extent of the cooling region of this cluster. So the region of uh, the cluster that is efficiently cooling. In doing this, uh, we first extracted the projected profiles of temperature and density and combine them together in order to get the cooling time profile that you can see plotted here. Again, the observation is short, only 10 kilosecond, and we, have, we need to have a relatively high number of counts uh, to be able to deproject the analysis. So we only have four beams up to uh, 100 kiloparsec, basically. Um, now, in order to get an estimate of the cooling region, we need to compare the cooling time profile. You can see the best fit here uh, in blue to a sort of uh, time limitation. Um, some years ago, what was done was to compare the cooling time to the Hubble time. So basically, uh, in the, at the radius within which the cooling time becomes uh, longer than the Hubble time, that is the maximum extent of the cooling region, because basically going further, the cooling is too slow to be uh, significant, to be relevant. In this work, we used a more constrained assumption that it's what is usually being done now, uh, that is 7.7 giga year, so the lookback time at a redshift of one. And the intersection between this limit and the cooling time profile gives us a cooling region that is around 40 kiloparsec. We then extracted a spectrum from this region and modeled the assumption of a self-absorbed hot plasma, of course, taking into account projection effects, um, to get an estimate of the cooling luminosity, the bolometric cooling luminosity, actually, that is around 2 times 10 to the 43 eric per second. And this estimate will be needed shortly. Now, before uh, uh, taking a look uh, at the core of this cluster, uh, combining all the data that we have, uh, let's take a look also at the age alpha line emission. This is a BMOS EHV observation that was uh, already published in 2016. Uh, in the figure, you can see the white contours from SDSS with the cyan cross representing the optical center that is also the position of the AGN. Uh, the green contours are VLA at 1.4 gigahertz, so our observation, and colorized is the age alpha emission that has the shape of a sort of uh, plume in the west with two apparent filaments on the, on the east. Um, we made use of the published age alpha luminosity and of the age alpha density that was estimated assuming equilibrium with the outer phase of the gas to determine the age alpha mass of the structure that is around 2.4 times 10 to the 6 solar masses. 
and probably we will need this estimate uh, later too. Now let's combine all uh, our data and uh, take a look at the core of this cluster. Uh, again, the green contours are uh, at 1.4 gigahertz. Uh, um, black is the age alpha with the peak of the age alpha is uh, being the, the white cross. The red cross on the other end represents uh, the X-ray peak that is also the center of the cooling. And we can see that there is a number of uh, displacements uh, between all these components. Uh, significantly, there is an offset of six kiloparsec between the position of the AGN and the cooling center, as well as a uh, um, slightly more enhanced offset uh, between uh, the X-ray peak and the age alpha peaks. So, uh, here on the right panel, you can see the images at the different, at the different bands uh, with the cyan cross representing again the, the AGN. Now, to try to um, understand what could possibly produce this environment, we need uh, uh, the last piece of the puzzle, that is the possible presence of cavities of the intercluster medium. Again, uh, our observation is short, so we need to be careful because usually you want to use a much longer observation to assess the presence of these structures. However, uh, three surface brightness uh, depressions uh, caught our, our attention, so A, B, and C. Uh, mainly due to their position. Uh, cavity A is coincident uh, with the west lobe of the radio galaxy, cavity B is close to the east lobe, and cavity C is symmetrical with respect to the, to the X-ray peak. Um, so first we want to measure the significance using this formula where Nm is the number of counts in a region close to the cavity and Nc is the number of counts within the cavity, of course with the same area. Um, However, uh, the number of counts is, of course, strongly dependent on the region that you choose to sample the counts. And since the observation is short, uh, changing the color scale of the image also changes uh, the apparent dimensions of these structures, of, of these uh, candidate cavities. So in order to be as careful as possible, uh, we decided to um, basically estimate for each cavity the sizes that correspond to a significance of two and three sigma. And these act as upper and lower limit for the cavity size. So let me explain this better. Basically, for example, for cavity A, we uh, ask it, okay, for example, what, is, what, what are the axes that gives us a significance of two sigma? And the same was done for three sigma. So we get an upper and lower limit, and the mean between these limits uh, uh, is the true size that we assumed for the, cavities, for the cavity size. Uh, so we did this for cavity A and for cavity B. While for cavity C, in order to reach these significances, we needed the, uh, to sample the counts from a region that was much larger with respect to the depression that was observed by I, even changing the color scale. So we decided to drop uh, candidate cavity C from the following analysis, basically. So with the axis that you can see uh, listed here, we are able to estimate the energetics uh, of the systems, for, so for PV, and the power making use of the cavity aids. The cavity age was determined as the ratio between the distance of the cavity from the X-ray peak and the sound velocity in this case, and should be around five mega year for both cavity A and cavity B. Here you can also see the cavity power, uh, five and four times 10 to the 42 arc per second for cavity A and B respectively. Um, now let's try to connect all the pieces of the puzzle and uh, uh, understand what is happening uh, in the core of this cluster. So this is just a qualitative um, hypothesis that we made based on the data that we have available, of course. In the paper, we also propose alternative explanations, especially for the origin of the age alpha gas. But this one is, uh, uh, looks like the most likely given our data. So we propose that at an initial stage, this cluster could have been relaxed with a full core. Uh, the cooling was centered uh, on the previous location of the XA peak, uh, so not here, but, but probably much closer to the, to the AGN. Um, and the cooling of the ECM uh, first produced the age alpha emission that we are observing, uh, probably not in this, posi in this position, but uh, much closer to the X-ray peak, so to, to the center of the cooling. However, at one point, a minor merger triggered sloshing. Sloshing is, the, is an oscillation of the gas within the cluster potential that uh, had the effect to basically displace uh, the X-ray peak, the outer phase of the gas, uh, from uh, the optical, uh, from, from the center of the galaxy, basically, from the AGN. Um, so this produced the, the offset, the six kiloparsec offset between these two components. However, the supermassive black hole is able, uh, through an outburst, to produce the jets and lobes that we observe for the radio galaxy. And this should have happened around five mega year ago because this is the age that we observe for the, that we estimate for the cavities. Uh, so even the cavities were of course uh, uh, produced during this phase, uh, 
but the expansion of the lobes uh, is able to push aside the age alpha gas. So basically, the age alpha gas is uh, uh, brought from the original location to the current location uh, from the expansion of the lobes. And this is why we are observing uh, the emission kind of correlated with, uh, with the west lobe of the radio galaxy. Uh, we also determined uh, the sloshing time scales, uh, making some assumptions, of, co of course, uh, around, being around 500 mega year, uh, while the expansion time scale of the lobes uh, should be of the order of a few mega year. This means that uh, uh, the radio lobes are not affected by sloshing because basically they are too young uh, to experience the, the, the gas motion. So this, uh, uh, this scenario could have produced the, the observed environment. Um, and uh, of course, uh, this also allows us to make some predictions on what we expect to see if this is the right explanation. For example, we should observe uh, nested cold fronts. Uh, cold fronts are contact discontinuities be between the, the hotter and the colder phase of the gas and are probably the major signature of ongoing sloshing. However, the current XR observation, observation is too shallow uh, to be able for us to confirm the, the presence of cold fronts. So we will need a deeper observation. Uh, we also expect to see cavities that are correlated with the radio jets and lobes of the radio galaxy. This is kind of what we are observing, but we need to uh, confirm the presence of these cavities because, uh, um, again, the, the observation is too short uh, currently. We also expect uh, the fil a filamentary distribution for the age alpha nebula due to the gas motions that uh, the gas has experienced. Um, to conclude, let's uh, try to understand whether these offsets are breaking the feedback cycle. This is because, uh, um, especially the offset between uh, the X-ray peak that is the center of the cooling and the AGN means that the cooling is not probably depositing gas directly into the supermassive black hole. And this could have, uh, of course, consequences on the, on the feedback cycle. So we plotted uh, the cavity power uh, estimated before on the y-axis and on the x-axis, the x-ray luminosity of the cooling region estimated during the X-ray analysis. And you can see that despite the offset, uh, AB1668 still lies within the scatter of the relation. So this means that uh, sloshing is not uh, interrupting or preventing the feedback cycle in this case. Actually, this is very similar to what we found uh, uh, in another cluster, ALBA2495, that we studied in another paper of 2019. This cluster showed very similar features, uh, including uh, two cavity systems uh, and uh, a very similar offset uh, between the X-ray peak uh, and uh, the AGN. And even in that case, we found that uh, the offset is probably not large enough uh, to produce any negative effect uh, on, on the feedback cycle. Uh, so to, so to, to conclude some takeaway messages, we found a small red galaxy in the BTG, and given the low luminosity and the shape, we can classify it uh, as an FR1. Uh, there is a, a six kiloparsec offset between the red emission and the X-ray emission, as well as a 7.6 kiloparsec offset between the X-ray and the H-alpha peaks. We also discussed the presence of two putative cavities, the H should be around five mega year, and we proposed gas motions, like for example, sloshing, and uh, the expansion of the lobes uh, uh, could have produced uh, the, the environment that we are observing currently in this cluster. But what about the next future? Uh, as you may have understood, we will request a deeper Chandra observation already in this uh, Chandra cycle to first uh, investigate on the presence of cold fronts that could help us to confirm the sloshing scenario, uh, to also confirm to better assess the presence of these cavities uh, and to more in general study the feedback cycle, uh, um, making use of a deeper observation. We will also take a look at uh, other bands, like for example, LOFAR at 150 megahertz to perform a more uh, thorough spectral analysis uh, and uh, to take a look at what is happening at low frequency. Actually, this is already happening because there already is a LOFAR observation available for this cluster. You can see it here. Uh, the green contours are again the BLA contours, uh, and you can see that LOFAR detects these very elongated and bent jets uh, that will be probably the subject of uh, future work. Also, we already obtained a Chandra follow up for the other cluster, AB2495. Um, the first paper of 2019 was based on an 8 kilosecond observation. The new one, you can see a preview here, is 130 kilosecond and is currently under analysis by a master student of Miriam Zitti. Uh, however, we can also, for example, see that uh, uh, two of the cavities that were tentatively detected making use of the, of the snapshot of eight kiloseconds 
are also present in the new observation, uh, in the new longer observation, of course. Um, also, we already have a lot of observation available even for this cluster that shows this very interesting feature that could possibly be a, a mini halo, but we need to further investigate this uh, to be uh, sure about this. So yeah, stay tuned because uh, even this will be the subject of a future work. And uh, with this, I'm done. Thank you. And if there is any question, I will be pleased to answer. Thank you, Thomas, for a wonderful talk. Um, if there are any questions, please uh, raise your hand or put them in the chat. I'm seeing some people clapping. No raised hands as of yet. Uh, yes, Magda. Yeah, hi. Um, nice talk, thanks. I, I was wondering, you mentioned there was a minor merger at some point in the past. Um, do you have any idea if um, that could have produced like a binary of supermassive black holes or um, is it likely not related to what you're seeing now? Uh, actually, we probably don't have enough data to say this uh, uh, because uh, yeah, the sloshing is usually triggered by, by binary mergers. Uh, but even looking into, for example, optical catalogs and infrared catalogs, we found no hint of the presence, for example, of a close by galaxy. So a galaxy close to the BCG, for example. Uh, so yeah, this is still uh, um, something that we need to investigate further. Uh, so the origin of the sloshing, if of course the sloshing is the right explanation for what we are observing. So we are, yeah, we, basically we are still uh, at the uh, initial phase of the study of this cluster because uh, uh, as I said, we need a deeper observation. Otherwise we, will, we won't be able to better assess all this, uh, uh, all this stuff basically. Okay, thanks. Um, what about, um, I'm not sure if uh, sort of uh, longer term um, Observations like light curves could tell you something about the presence of maybe a still ongoing binary that's not merged. Um, is that? Do you know if there's any plans to do to do that? Uh, sorry, uh, you said the X observation could help us uh, to find. Oh, um, so to determine the presence of a binary that's still there. Yeah. Um, probably the resolution is never going to be good enough to actually um, figure that out for sure, yeah. but. Um, um, but long-term observations of the luminosity can indicate um, if there's a periodicity uh, in the luminosity and can potentially constrain if there's a binary. So I was wondering if you know if there is any such information or data out there, or if you're planning uh, to do that in the future. Actually, we didn't think about this yet. Uh, so it's not uh, in our plan, but uh, yeah, this is, a good, uh, this is a good idea and uh, probably worth discussing. Uh, yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Well, I don't see any other questions in the chat or any other raised hands, so Hey, maybe we can end a minute early today. Um, if anybody else would like to speak to either of our speakers, there are spots open on their meeting schedules. So please go sign up. Uh, a big thank you to both our speakers for joining us, uh, especially when they're in a time zone where it's rather late for them. So thank you again for joining us and for the wonderful talks. And uh, we'll see you all next week. Thanks.